Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about fusiform cells, their firing rates, and how high frequency noise can be dangerous for some people. I'm also going to be giving a small little update about my Susan Shore device usage later on in the video, so be sure to keep watching. Again, I would like to thank every single one of our channel members for supporting my research and supporting the channel overall. And a quick little reminder to those who are subscribed as members, to have your role synchronize with the Discord channel, you need to go to your user settings in Discord and to connect the YouTube channel you subscribed as a member with to your Discord account. And then the server, the Discord server, will automatically synchronize the given um, role with your role on the YouTube channel. Now let's get down to the video. Now fusiform cells in the dorsal cochlear nucleus are central to how our brain processes sound. They adjust their firing patterns based on the frequency of incoming signals from the auditory nerve fibers. And they employ two main strategies, phase locking at lower frequencies and rate coding at higher frequencies. Now about phase locking, at lower frequencies such as 500 hertz, every cycle of the sound wave is around 2 milliseconds long. Now this gives the fusiform cell enough time to phase lock. They fire in sync with specific phases of each cycle. Because low frequency cycles last longer, the cell membrane can repolarize fully before the next wave arrives. This timing based mechanism is highly precise and very energy efficient. Now, if anybody is confused about these cycles, um, something like 500 hertz or the frequency of the sound is the number of vibrations that occur per second. So if you take a look at a speaker, you can see that the low and you know during the low frequency, the speaker vibrates slower. So something like heavy bass, like maybe 20 hertz, is just 20 vibrations per second. And when you go to the higher frequencies, the speaker starts vibrating faster and faster. Now when the sound frequencies start getting higher and higher, and when they get above roughly four to five kilohertz, which is four to five thousand vibrations per second, the phase locking begins to fail. The wave cycles arrive too quickly uh, for the fusiform cells to reset their membrane potentials before the next cycle. And at these higher frequencies, they switch to what I mentioned before, uh, rate coding. Now, instead of matching each cycle, they increase their overall firing rate to signal that a high frequency tone is present. Now you're probably thinking, how does the brain differentiate one high frequency from the other one? Well, in rate coding, a fusiform cell's firing rate correlates with not only the presence, but also the intensity of high frequency sound, even though it does not track each individual cycle. Now, once the firing rate reaches the biological limit, um, defined by factors such as the cell's refractory period, which is a brief time period immediately following a nerve impulse when the neuron cannot fire again. Um, and membrane recovery times, there's other stuff related to that. Um, it hits saturation and cannot increase further no matter how intense or rapid the stimulus becomes. Now, even though fusiform cells do lose their very fine temporal precision at higher frequencies, they still rely on the cochlea's tonotopic organization, where specific regions respond best to certain frequencies. And uh, when integrating inputs from distinct locations along the cochlea, fusiform cells can differentiate high frequencies like 14 and 15 kilohertz, primarily based on which nerve fibers are activated rather than the precise timing of each sound wave cycle. 
Now another very essential piece of this system is the network of inhibitory interneurons, especially the cartwheel and vertical cells in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Now these interneurons, they refine fusiform cell output by inhibiting firing at frequencies just outside the fusiform cell's preferred range, enhancing the frequency selectivity and preventing the neurons from becoming overwhelmed by excessive fast input. Now in conditions like tinnitus, this delicate balance is very often disrupted. And when inhibitory signaling is compromised, especially for high frequency inputs, fusiform cells actually may over respond to these inputs. And instead of firing at a controlled rate, they risk saturating really fast and firing excessively or, you know, remaining hyperactive. High frequency sounds can and are particularly problematic because they continuously push the fusiform cells toward their upper firing limits without adequate inhibition. Um, the cells fail to filter or to gate these signals properly, and uh, this can actually lead to the reinforcement of maladaptive feedback loops or spontaneous firing in the dorsal cochlear nucleus, aka tinnitus. Now overall, when fusiform cells reach their maximum firing rate, no additional input can boost their output. And under healthy conditions, inhibitory neurons help keep fusiform cells within their optimal firing ranges. But in tinnitus, if inhibition is already compromised, the consistent barrage of high frequency signals can make the cells even more hyperactive or, you know, stuck in these elevated firing states. Now, the mechanisms of how rate coding works is actually one of the reasons why a lot of people experience tinnitus at very high frequencies. Now, a little bit of a conclusion. At low frequencies, fusiform cells use phase locking, and they align or synchronize their spikes of their action potentials with each sound wave cycle. Now, at higher frequencies, above 5 kilohertz about, they shift to rate coding, and they modulate their average firing rate rather than tracking every wave cycle. And the tonotopic organization in the cochlea guides which fusiform cells are activated based on the auditory nerve fiber input, helping to differentiate the frequencies further and inhibitory interneurons maintain this balance and accuracy of the frequency processing, preventing overload. And when the inhibition weakens, like in tinnitus, or when it weakens even more, like in reactive tinnitus, for example, um, the high frequency inputs can overwhelm the fusiform cells, and during very catastrophic or severe cases, it can actually cause the frequencies to overlap with each other. Now that's all about phase locking and uh, about rate coding. Hopefully it was understandable enough. Now let's get down to the update that I have. Now the update is not very significant because I'm currently testing the V2 device that I have right now with an oscilloscope, making sure that everything works correctly, etc., etc. Um, so after that initial 20 minute session that I did, I did two more sessions and I was experimenting with electrode placement and whatnot. Now, after these two sessions, I did not do more than that. So altogether, it's about three sessions only. And after those sessions, I realized that my tinnitus began morphing and shifting con continuously, actually, throughout the day. 
So, for example, um, one update that I gave to some of my members in the community was the day after my last session, I was lying on my bed on my cervical pillow, really relaxed, and I was just taking a break from all of the research. And I had an absolutely random bout of about 30 minutes of near silence. Now, this is actually crazy because I have never experienced tinnitus that was so quiet or I never ex I never remember experiencing tinnitus that was so quiet and I did a whole bunch of tests like opening the window and making sure that I could not hear my tinnitus over it closing myself in a quiet room or uh, turning on the sink at various levels of intensity to absolutely confirm 100% that my tinnitus was actually quieter and it was quieter. Now, unfortunately, this did not last. This near silence did not last because I presume this was because I started doing a lot of somatosensory modulations like bending my neck and, you know, flexing my jaw and, you know, pressing a bunch of places around my face. And after I did that, the tinnitus kind of started creeping back up a little bit. But I can say that the frequency of my tinnitus is much more pleasant than it used to be. So it is right now at a very pleasant uh, hiss. Um, and the frequency spectrum of my tinnitus tone is also a little bit more narrow. So usually I would have like a mix of tonal and hissing. And right now I just have hissing, nothing else. And now I, the next update is going to be kind of controversial. And I don't recommend people do this at all. Um, but uh, literally yesterday, I went to an office party that was at a pool, and they had some, you know, pretty moderately loud music. Uh, I could handle this music, by the way, with no issues, even with my hyperacusis. And only when they turned it up, I actually put in my earplugs. Um, but I noticed that after that whole, you know, that whole situation, like a couple of hours of being in this loud environment, I noticed that when I got home, my tinnitus was actually quieter for some reason. It was even more, I guess you could say, hissy. Um, I have no idea why this happened, uh, but I have some theories, but I'm not going to be discussing it here. But I have a feeling that using the Susan Shore device that I made, the V2, a couple of times, I guess kind of maybe uh, biased my dorsal cochlear nucleus towards a more plastic state, meaning that my tinnitus changes more. Um, not in a bad way, but, you know, I guess you could say more in a good way. So we will see what happens. I'm going to continue testing. Currently, I'm not testing it on myself, but I will resume it in the future. So be as that, you know, be as it may, you can make your own conclusions based on this. And I understand that I am only one person, and I am also a super responder. So I'm not really the perfect example to look at for the efficacy uh, for the general population. But I hope that update was interesting enough for you guys to hear. Um, I can say that definitely everything is moving on in a more pleasant manner, I can say. Much more pleasant than it used to be before. And as usual, if you'd like to continue scientific discussions about tinnitus, hyperacusis, noxacusis, and all of these conditions, um, you're free to join my Discord channel, which will be linked in the description and in the pinned comment. You can also connect with other sufferers and discuss your case with them and with us overall. So that's about it for today. See ya.